This show is dedicated to our good friend Fender. He was the best deer and turkey camp dog we've ever known. Rest in peace, my friend. We'll miss you, buddy. Deer, when they're hit, depending on how they're hit, but they typically, particularly if it's a visiting buck, you know, because bucks roam right. during breeding season, particularly if it's a visiting buck, if they get hit, no matter how they're hit, if they're not dropping dead momentarily, their goal is to get back to safe zone, whatever they have identified as safe zone. Hmm. So if safe zone is five miles away, that's where they're going to go if they're not dying. And if they're dying, they're going to make an attempt to do it and if water is on the way there, they will die in water. If water's not on the way there, they might not. Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast, episode number 254. Wounded Deer Tracking Dogs, The Blood Trailers. Diane Richardson, Joanne Greer, and Mike LaFleur. Support for the Big Buck Registry and the Deer Hunt Podcast comes from Hunter's Blend Coffee, imported directly from family farms, roasted and brought to you by hunters who support the hunting industry. Polar Works Coolers and the Chill Zone, specializing in the most durable, reliable thermal cups and coolers. Keep your drinks hot or cold in any element. Covert Scouting Cameras, remote cameras for hunting, wildlife, and security. Morse's Sporting Goods, a full line of sporting goods without the sales tax. And Big Buck Merch. You can get cool, high-quality Big Buck t-shirts, long-sleeve t-shirts, and hoodies and show support for this podcast by visiting www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash M-E-R-C-H. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hi, this is Barry Wenzel from Brothers of the Bow and Trophy Whitetail Boot Camps. I'm not really sure what a podcast is, but you're about to push play on what is now my favorite podcast, Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. This is Bill Vale from PressuredDeerPro.com, and you're listening to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. Hello, this is Cuz Strickland with Mossy Oak, and you're about to listen to the podcast that I listen to 16 and a half hours nonstop. The Big Buck Registry is the best out there. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, fellow predators. My name is Jay. Thank you for tuning in to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. For Dusty Phillips and Jim Keller and the entire staff here at the Big Buck Registry, welcome to this week's show. There are a couple things I'd like you to do for us if you could. If you would, please check us out on iTunes. Subscribe and leave us a review. With your help, we're going to try and push this show up the iTunes charts. I know we have a lot of listeners out there and I need you to take some action. I need you to leave a review and subscribe to the show. If you do subscribe, that'll give you access and notification each and every week that a new show is released. You can also access this show in its entirety on YouTube, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Play, and as an Amazon Alexa skill. Go to Alexa and say, Alexa, enable Big Buck Registry. It's all right there for you to access on demand at your fingertips. Regarding the harness program, we have an ample supply of harnesses to give away from our volunteer donors. If you're in need of a full body harness, please send an email to j at bigbuckregistry.com. Sometimes those kill shots don't go as planned, or sometimes, despite a double lung shot, the deer finds its way into terrain or structure that make the wounded deer track undetectable to the hunter. A trained deer tracking dog can be an immeasurable asset to a hunter in situations just like this, and it's the right thing to do out of respect for the animal. But how does it work? What should we expect when we call in the dogs? We invited a panel of volunteer leash dog trackers into the studio to discuss many of the issues surrounding tracking a wounded deer with a trained dog. We'll turn to our entire conversation with Diane, Joanne, and Mike in just one second. But before we do, let's hear from our friends at Polo Works Coolers and Jim Keller with the Deer News. Folks, I want to tell you about one of the best coolers I've found for the price in quite a while. I always wanted one of those high-end coolers because of the quality that I had heard of, but I couldn't justify the price. Then I found Polar Works. 
Finally, I found a company that understands quality and affordability. The Polar Works lineup is extensive and is filled with polar cups, polar tubs, and polar soft coolers. What do I love about these coolers? Well, for one, the ice stays frozen for a long, long period of time. But they've thought of other things in their design. For example, drain speed. No one likes a slow drain after a long weekend on the trail. And there's the non-slip polar feet. Polar feet will prevent sudden movement when you're on the move. Polar tubs hold ice for such a long period of time because of the three inch insulated walls, the heavy duty gaskets, and the fail proof hinges, which guarantee a freezer tight seal. So check out polarworks.com when you're considering your next high quality cooler without breaking the bank. That's www.polarworks.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Our first story this week. Deer hunt possible in Saddle River, New Jersey. This story is from the NewJersey.com website and was reported by Sarah Nolan. A controversial hunt to reduce the number of deer in Saddle River, New Jersey will be considered by the Borough Council on Monday after a non-lethal plan to capture and spay the animals was rejected by the state last month. The denial leaves the Borough with no other option than a lethal call, Mayor Al Kirpus said Friday. The proposed resolution to immediately establish and implement a call program is the council's latest attempt in a years-long saga to limit a population explosion that officials say is putting the health and welfare of residents at risk. Heightened incidents of Lyme disease, deer vehicle collisions, and the possibility that deer are attracting dangerous predators like coyotes are concerns of town officials and some residents. The destruction to the local environment is also worrisome, they say. The State Division of Fish and Wildlife rejected the non-lethal plan based on the low likelihood of success and the inability to bring relief to the residents. Councilman Ron Yates, liaison to the Borough Environmental Commission, said the council now has no alternative other than a hunt. Borough Administrator Jerry Giamas said that if passed, the resolution will allow the administration to begin developing a program. Whether that involves hunters using guns, bows, and arrows, or a combination will be determined. Yates said the borough would likely invite hunters to come to town on a volunteer basis to hunt only at specific times in controlled setting, from tree stands and large open spaces where deer are baited. Court overturns Florida deer hunting dogs case. This story is from the DeerAndDeerHunting.com website. The use of hunting dogs will continue in northwest Florida following an appeals court. Florida residents whose property abutted the Blackwater management area waged a lengthy legal battle that began in 2016 against this type of hunting, arguing that it infringed on their property and created a nuisance, the Daily Business Review reports. Last week, by a majority vote, the three-panel First District Court of Appeals overturned a ruling which would have required the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission to end the use of deer hunting dogs. This type of hunting allows hunters to use dogs to flush out deer and has been permitted in the Blackwater management area for years, according to the Daily Business Review. Property owners included a takings claim in their lawsuit which contends that hunters used dogs to hunt deer during the brief hunting season kept them from using and enjoying their property. The Blackwater Management Area is located in Okaloosa and Santa Rosa counties and is a patchwork-like composition because of the way the state buys land for conservation and recreational purposes, which adds to the issue. DNA results show mysterious canine is a wolf. This story is from the OutdoorNews.com website. A canine creature shot in Montana a month ago that captured the curiosity of the nation is actually a gray wolf, the Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Department said in a news release Monday, June 18th. DNA from the animal, which was shot legally by a rancher near Denton on May 16th, was tested at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Forensic Laboratory in Ashland, Oregon. The lab compared the animal's DNA with thousands of other DNA samples from wolves, coyotes, and dogs. The conclusion was clear. This animal is a gray wolf from the northern Rocky Mountains. Confusion about the animal might be due to the condition of the animal and the photos, which seem to show short legs and big ears. Inspection of the animal at the Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Wildlife Lab in Bozeman revealed a relatively normal-looking dark brown wolf. The wolf was a non-lactating female, which means she didn't have a litter of pups. It's estimated that the wolf was between two and three years old. Wolves are fairly common in Montana. According to the 2017 Montana Gray Wolf Program Annual Report, Population estimates suggest there are approximately 900 wolves in the state. This marks the 13th consecutive year that Montana has far exceeded wolf recovery goals. Property owners of Montana have broad legal authority to shoot wolves they feel might be a threat to their livestock, as was the case with this wolf near Denton. Coyote attacks teenager in Massachusetts. This story is from the foxnews.com website and was reported by Zoe Zath. A coyote attacked a teen in the woods of Massachusetts. 
The incident happened in Swamp Scott, northeast of Boston, on Saturday night, and paramedics rushed the 17-year-old victim to a hospital, according to the stations. The circumstances surrounding the attack were unclear. The Swamp Scott Police Department took to Facebook on Saturday evening. This evening, in a wooded area between Burpee Road and the Upper Jackson Field, there was an incident involving a coyote bite, authorities said. Police told WBZ, which didn't report the age of the victim, that the teen's injuries weren't life-threatening. Swamp Scott Police did not immediately respond to a request for comment for Fox News. That concludes this week's edition of the Big Buck Groceries Dear News. Special thanks to Daniel Applebaum for leads and some of the stories. For links to the stories featured this week, please check our show notes at www.bigbuckregistry.com. If you have any ideas for future topics or have any questions about any of these topics, please email me at jim at bigbuckregistry.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Well, thanks to Jim Keller for the Deer News. Without further ado, here is Diane Richardson, Joanne Greer, and Mike LaFleur, the Blood Trailers. Diane, Joanne, and Mike, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. How are you, my friends? Good. Good, thank you. Doing well. Excellent. How are you, Joanne? Good. Thank you for having us. Oh, we're psyched. We're psyched. You know, this, this topic is very interesting to me. We, I was introduced to the whole concept of dog tracking for downed deer um, a long time ago, but I attended one of your seminars, and it, to me, it was the best seminar of the whole day, and... I, I learned more in that and learned more about a, a subject matter that was more vast than I ever had dreamed. You know, you think that, okay, I'm going to call this person to come help me track my deer with a dog. And I've certainly heard about stories in other states about where, you know, this is the, the avenue, but there's so much more to it. And there's some extremely colorful stories that come out of it. And we're going to get into that down the road. Uh, but, it's a phenomenal service. I know you're a group of friends that got together to do this, to track with your your animals and your and and help hunters find down game. Uh, it's a great service that you're doing. But I wanted to learn more about what you're doing because what I learned at your seminar, I think, was exactly right for our show, and that everybody that listens to our show should be aware of how in depth this program is. Diane, let's let's start with you. Tell me a little bit about yourself, who you are and which associations or groups you're associated with. Well, I'm Diane Richardson. I'm from Springfield, New Hampshire. That's up in the Lake Sunapee region. I grew up pretty much in that area. Um, I've done both competitive tracking with AKC, which is human tracking, and also I do... Human tracking? Human tracking. Okay. It's it's a titling sport. Okay. Um, And then I ran into Ed Wills back in maybe 2006 and i got the genini book at a outdoor show okay. on uh training dogs for finding wounded deer is it finding wounded deer or tracking for finding wounded deer okay and so i i was w- with ed and ed was in the process of making it legal here in new hampshire and it's kind of a long process because the public thought that we were just going to take dogs out and chase deer down and pretend we found them and it, so there was a lot of public outcry kind of <laughs> right in like the hawkeye and stuff um so i met up with ed and and worked with him a little bit behind the scenes and and he really pushed through and got it legal in new hampshire and it got it was legal in new hampshire in t- the hunting season of 2008 and i started tracking then gotcha and so i've been tracking 10 years now okay. so then ed eventually moved away and sort of delegated me to be the holder of the statistics hmm. uh so around that time or, or shortly before that, I created a Facebook group called New Hampshire Blood Trackers. It's not a formal organization. I just wanted to give all the New Hampshire Fish and Game licensed leash tracking dog handlers a place that they could centralize if they wanted to and contact each other. And, and uh, So every year I, I gather the stats together and I release them in detail to all the trackers and in summary to the public to try to further the interest in okay. using the service. Gotcha. Joanne, what about you? How do you fit into the mix? Well, I don't think I was very typical. Um, I don't hunt. I didn't have hunters. I'm a mother of three, a master gardener, an equestrian who likes to ride in the woods during the fall. So I went to Germany with um, – two friends, one of which was German, and we fell in love with these wire-haired dachshunds. And one by one, we each 
acquired one and started doing rabbit trials and hunting with them. Um, sort of like it's a game that you play with your dogs and bunnies. And eventually when I heard um, I got my dog from Andy Bensing, who was then president of United Blood Trackers Association out of Pennsylvania. And my dog was of pet quality. So um, they legalized tracking in New Hampshire, and I immediately went and signed up for the Laconia um, uh, workshop that they were doing and introducing other handlers to this um, process. Um, and Andy was there, and John Jan and I were there, and and we had a wonderful, we had a great time. And it wasn't more than two months later that I got my first call, so I just sort of fell into the, and it was a successful call. We recovered the deer, and it just sort of, um, I loved it. It was very exciting. That's cool, Mike. How about yourself? How do you fit into the mix? I'm uh, I come from a strong hunting family. I was born and raised uh, hunting. Did quite a bit in Vermont. I've got uh, two uncles that own dairy farms and uh, very familiar with tracking deer and um, finding deer on our own. And uh, one thing I'd like to mention with uh, the leash dog tracking is, uh, you know, the gist of it is we we want people, we want hunters to find their deer. Um, You know, this, the leash dog tracking is is a tool. Um, And I think social media has really come into play with it, you know, in the last couple of years um, that, you know, everything that you see on social media now is when somebody mentions that they hit a deer, um, the first thing that people say is, well, call the dogs, call the dog. Um, you know, and, and don't get me wrong, I, I love to see my dog work, um, but I'd rather, um, you know, have, have a hunter find his deer on his own if it's findable, you mm-hmm. know, if it's recoverable. Um, and some people just don't know how to track. Um, I, was, uh, I was fortunate enough to be born and raised with it. Um, you know, you learn the little tips and tricks of where to look, how to look, you know, read what the deer's doing. Um, and I'll tell you, since I've been running the dog, um, let me back up. I, I, I ran a small guide service, and uh, one year we lost three bear, um, one right after the next. And it uh, really set me back. Um, you know, I felt that I was a very accomplished eye tracker you know i could track animals on my own very well and uh, we lost three bears and i said there's got to be something different there's i got to do something and i looked into uh leash dog tracking and this was a a year uh just after they did the big seminar um up in laconia um with united blood trackers i'd missed that um but i got in contact with uh john neal at the gen and a um and read their read their book which is the bible for leash dog tracking um, and a profound respect on, on John. In, uh, uh, anyways, I ended up getting a dog uh, bred through their breeding program. Um, and my dog's name's Ted. Uh, <laughs> in, uh, in Ted, we trust now. Um, you, you learn to trust your dog. Uh, Ted will be eight in October. So roughly, uh, you know, seven years of tracking now with them. And, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't, I would have trained it. I wouldn't trade it for the, uh, for the world. It's, uh, it, it's a great experience. And you learn so much from not just uh, what you thought you knew about deer tracking, you know, my background. Um, but what the dogs will show you is, is, a, is a whole other world of, it, it, it is, it's really cool. It's amazing. Yeah, I like to say that whatever you thought you knew about deer behavior, you start tracking a few years with a dog, and that all goes right out the window. <laughs> I, I bet you've you've learned more with your dogs than a hunter could learn in a lifetime about where deer go. Uh, absolutely, the uh, the old wise tales of you know <laughs> wounded wounded deer. You know, a wounded deer won't go uphill, or you know, gut shot deer always goes to water. And uh, <laughs> I'll make a shout out to Roscoe Blaisdell. Um, I've tracked uh, I've tracked a, a deer or two for him, and uh, you know he's he's always said you know uh, a gut shot deer doesn't always go to water, and, it, and a large percentage of my gut shot deer will go to water. And I had one this year, and uh, you know I was adamant at, at that most of my gut shots go to water, and uh, you know he was adamant that they don't. And this year I did one, and I had a gut shot deer climb uphill, you know, and we found it on top of a ridge. And there was plenty of water, you know, stream bed, brook bed, um, you know, where this deer could have bedded and typically should have. And this one bedded on top of the mountain. And uh, I was I was impressed. I made a shout-out to Roscoe. I said, hey, you, you are right. You know, you, you always learn something new. You know, you don't... You, 
you like to think that you know everything, <laughs> but you you don't. And uh, right. it's, it's a great opportunity to to be humble about it and you know learn from those experiences. Gotcha. I think I think one of the hardest parts though is that we track you know anywhere between say twenty and eighty tracks in a year, and the hunters are sometimes really hard to convince that we and the dogs are are right and and that the deer went left instead of right or up instead of down and and sometimes they're a real hard sell they're a real hard sell sometimes but you know sometimes we track more deer in one season than a hunter has their entire life right makes sense how did you all meet (laughs) um this past winter or two winters now gotten together after hunting season at a designated place um it gets larger and larger each year (laughs) and we've all become great friends it's a close-knit group Um, we rely on each other if i can't get to a call i call out to another tracker Um, it's a wonderful group of people and you know hopefully we have each other's backs all the time and and you know we're on it and we compare notes and we learn from each other too that's so you each one of you are licensed in the state of New Hampshire as leash trackers. Yes. Okay. All right. And yeah. so how many are there in the state of New Hampshire? I can answer that question. I bet you can. You're a stat, <laughs> you're <a> stat lady. <laughs> well, I don't, have, I don't have all the stats. But no, I'm each, sure it's each, off by Each generally. year, I mean, I have all the stats at home, but I didn't yeah. bring them all with me. Uh, each year, it grows a little bit. We tend to average um, between around 16 and 26 trackers not all of them track publicly some of them are what we call friends and family trackers okay they get their license to help their friends and family so they don't take any calls and there's one or two guys that are guides and only track for their clients um so i can pretty much see that at the you know the end of the season you know you can ask not to have your name on the fishing game list and you don't get public calls that way uh, but last year we had 26 trackers, okay. which is which is quite a few, and that counts the friends and family trackers and and the guide. Um, and I think that's the most trackers we've had. But it, typically, it runs between 17 and 26 okay. for the whole state. But most of them are in the southeast section of the state. Gotcha. Okay. You talked about legalization, where it used to not be legal in the state of New Hampshire, and it's not legal to track deer with leash dogs in some states still from what i understand what was the the perspective of the state before it was legalized what why wasn't it legal way back i just don't think it's traditional in new hampshire it's a european tradition okay in some countries it's mandatory to have a tracker lined up before you go out hunting and uh, we had a tracker here joe you guys we had joe here from germany Joe is a, a licensed tracker in Germany, certified tracker, whatever they call it over there. And he has his dog, which is also a German dog. And he said over there, if you wing a deer and give it, his word was, if you give it a hangnail, they are expected to take a dog out and recover that deer. Now over there, they track dog, they track with the dog until the dog indicates that they're close to the deer. Mm. And then they slip the dog and let it run loose and bay the deer. In most northern states in the U.S., the dogs have to remain on a leash. In a lot of the southern states, there's the option to run them loose. In the United States, I don't think I'm very comfortable with running my dog loose after a deer. Um, right. But but that's it's a European tradition, and it came to... Were the Jenanis the first people to bring it to the U.S.? Do you know? um, they started Deer Search. I'm yeah. not sure. Um, Andy had a lot of yeah. connections in Germany also. And I think New York was one of the first states for it to be legal because that's where the Jenanis are. And they started an organization called Deer Search. And then they started United Blood Trackers, which is a national organization to unite hunters and to work on legalization. And uh, Mike and Joanne are members of that, and they can speak more about that. Okay. What? When did it become legal in New Hampshire? 2008. 2008. All right. And do you remember the process? Were you involved back then, or was this some you were? I was... Um I was at the very beginning because I had a dog, and I was told it probably would be a good tracker. Um, So I went to the first um, seminar that they gave, and they came down and presented, and Ed Wills was there. I got to meet Ed, who was the proponent of it. Yeah, Ed worked on it for a couple years. Yeah, but it's really gained momentum, it seems, every year. 
you come in some days and there's eight and ten messages on your answering machine wow. by noontime. Wow. It's just overwhelming. It seems like it would be accepted as a good thing, not a detrimental aspect, right? It depends on who you talk to. Okay. Um, some of the real diehard, traditional Yankee, New England hunters, it's a real hard sell. Um, as each year goes by, though, we're winning more of them. <laughs> like, can you get inside Mike, their head? Like, what What is it that they're holding on to that is so well, Mike can probably. destructive? Uh, I'll, I'll get off on a little tangent. I'll tell a quick story. Okay. Um, and it, it goes with what we're talking about. Uh, I had a, a father give me a call. Uh, this past season, um, and the son hit a hit a, hit his first deer, hit a nice buck, and uh, they they did their own tracking. Um, this was a, a long day for them. They they were set up in the morning. They shot it first thing in the morning, um, and they did a heck of a job tracking their own deer. Um, and they told me about you know what happened. You know when you when you get a call and you get a tracking call, you do a, a phone interview. Um, and right, right then and there, you can, you know, with asking questions and getting the answers, you can somewhat tell, you know, what type of track it may turn into be not always, but you get a good gist of it. Um, and the, the track that they were, um, telling me about the, the hit, uh, to me, it was going to be a feel good track. Um, and getting back to, you know, why people are calling this, you know, leash dog tracking is, is a, a tool. It's it's another avenue. So when you exhaust all your other efforts, um, and and these this father and son did an awesome job. They went over a thousand yards. Um, took them most of the day, um, but they were finding little droplets of blood. You know, path of least resistance. You know, things that we learn um, as a hunter growing up. You know, of you know, typically the deer wouldn't go here because of you know this is so thick over here or um, you know topography. Um, you know, and, and they did that. They did a, they did a great job. Um, they just lost blood and with the dog, um, and this particular gentleman, um, he, uh, he wanted to exhaust all his efforts. Um, you know, and they spent most of the day looking for this deer. And, and when he was telling me about the hit, I wasn't so convinced that we were going to actually recover that deer. Um, you know, that, that deer from, from what I was being told, it was going to die. That that was going to be a dead deer, but not a recoverable deer um, with a dog on the leash. Mm. Um, and, you know, the the wounds, is it going to die? I believe yes. I believe that deer would have died, but not today, not tomorrow. Um, and fast forward, we did recover that deer. Um, there was a set of circumstances that I decided to take the track. Um, we were coming back from... Uh, my daughter's soccer game and we had it on on the phone on the car and my wife's looking at me saying you need to do this track they seem like really nice people and i'm like it's a feel-good track we're not going to recover this deer and uh you know but the father put it out there that you know he wanted to exhaust every possibility so we took the track and it was i don't know i think we started at 10 o'clock at night uh we recovered that deer at 1 30 in the morning um unfortunately the coyotes had uh had killed the deer um, and it got law it, it, the deer got stuck in the brook and, uh, I can go on about the track, how it went. It was amazing what the dog did. Um, it was just a great track, but what a feeling, what of accomplishment of, you know, somebody trying to recover their deer on their own. Um, and they did a great job. Um, but when you lose sign, um, and there was no blood, there was no blood for the last 700, 800 yards of that track. Um, and just trusting the dog, um, you know, um, and, you know, learning to read the dog. Uh, it just doesn't happen overnight. You don't get a puppy and, and you, you think you're going to have, um, you know, the greatest tracking dog. You, it takes a lot of work, a lot of effort, um, and dedi- you, a lot of dedication. Um, you know, you basically get out of what, what you put into it. Um, and people getting, you know, new, new puppies, training new puppies. We've got some people that are actually um, they attended our, our seminar that we did there and they're, they're in the process of training their dogs and, you know, the dog has it built into them. They're wired for it, you know, certain breeds. Um, and, uh, you know, you can go off of that, you know, you can train them and it, it's really, you're not training the dog. You're actually training, you know, the, the handler, the handler has to learn to be, to, to work, you know, to, to make it You're you're a team. It's just not the dog going out and tracking. 
you know you're supporting the dog and the dog dog is supporting you yep. that's that's a that's a key point too gotcha you know and you learn you build a bond with your dog um you know and and once you have that bond and once you recognize you have that bond together um it's it's unbelievable it's it it's a great feeling and uh what an accomplishment you can you know and, and you can tell whether that you you're gonna recover that animal or not you know, most of the time within a few minutes, you know, of, of running that, the dog dog can tell you, um, you know, when you have a dog like that. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I do think, though, that that a lot of people just are stuck. Uh, less than before, less than in years past. This was a really good year. We had 409 total tracks this year. And uh, 2014, we only had 125 total tracks. Okay. So this was a good year. But you get people who th- who think, you know, if you can't find your own deer, you don't deserve to have your deer. You know, you're not a good enough hunter. And so they're either not going to call a tracker because they think it's a blow right. to their ego or or they're going to wait until they and 20 of their best friends have grid searched for 12 hours before they call us and make a big mess. Right. Let me throw this out there then. If are there stats and i would assume no matter what the number is that it's got to be skewed because of ego you know embarrassment or whatever but how many deer actually go missing after a hit i don't think anybody keeps those stats i don't think they do no and i'm not sure that anybody would necessarily admit that even if you had you don't have a number hey i hit a deer unrecovered no, I don't. I don't think anyone's got those stats. But that would be an interesting stat to know, right? Like, look, how how much more effective is deer tracking versus? Well, I know that the national average and New Hampshire average for recovery for the dogs is around thirty three to thirty five percent. Okay. So the rest of them are either deer, like Mike was talking about, they they are going to die, but they're not going to die today, tomorrow, or the next day because they're too mobile. Right. Um, you get out there with a dog and a handler and a hunter and whoever else in the peanut gallery is coming with us. And some of these deer who are still highly mobile, you're not going to catch them. You know, a hunter might be better off going in and still hunting that deer instead of instead of having right. us come in. Right. Um, but, you know, some of the deer we track are never going to die. They're, you know, they had a haircut or something. And... You know, some of the deer are lightly wounded, but still really mobile, and we can't catch them. And probably the hunter, even still hunting, couldn't catch them. Right. And some deer are just complete misses. <laughs> you know, the hunt will get there, and it'll be like, there's no way you hit this deer. Right. Oh, look at all the blood. I got all the blood. That deer is definitely dead. <laughs> definitely dead. <laughs> look at the blood. That's. We get that a lot. I think the first deer I ever hit with a bow and arrow, there was blood everywhere. And I had some hunters that... You know, it was my first year hunting. I had guys that were 30-year hunters, extremely you know, hardened deer hunting veterans. Like They couldn't find it. it was, there were, I mean, there was so much blood, you thought that was a dead deer right there. But then it dried up, mm-hmm. and it was nothing. If I had a tracking dog, that might have helped. But then again, you might have said it was, you know, it was a bad shot. Or, yeah, I mean, it depends on where you hit it. Some of the places you hit a deer is never going to kill that deer. Right. Never. You know, like leg wounds. Oh, dear God, leg wounds. They'll leave you an ocean. Yes. An absolute right. ocean. You know, I, d- I did one last year that literally, you know, eighth of an inch of blood anywhere that deer stopped. Right. And then it dried up. And they've got a picture of him on their trail camera. He's three-legged, but he's perfectly fine. Did you recover the arrow on that? Yes, yeah. I did. And blood soaked tip to tail? It was. Okay. It was. Were you in the stand or on the ground? I was in the stand. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and stand how high up? Uh, granted, this was 20 years yeah, ago. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I think it was it was probably 15 feet up. Okay. Thereabouts. And how was how far was the deer? I think it was about a 30 yard shot. 30 yard. And how was the deer positioned? <laughs> it was broadside. Um, head was to my right. Okay. Tail was to the left. Completely broadside, quartering to, quartering away. Prob- uh, I think it was slightly quartering away, but very slight. Okay. And you recovered the arrow. What did the deer do when the arrow hit him? You know, that's the part that's foggy because it was my first <laughs> yeah. deer. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure. You, you can see where I'm going with Absolutely. this, though. Yeah. yeah. I know yeah. where the deer went. Yeah. And it 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 started kind of to veer off to my right and then did a hard left and headed back out through a swamp. Yeah. It was impassable, but it went from a puddle to a drip to nothing. 
Yeah. yeah. You could see the direction that it went, but then there was nothing to follow. Yeah. Did you smell the arrow? Back then, no. Yeah. Today, I, I would smell it in a heartbeat. <laughs> right. Yep. Yeah, you learn a lot in 20 years. Oh, absolutely. Right. No, and, and I'm not I'm not shaming. That's not, right. uh, you know, there's so much to learn. Um, we just did a, a, a seminar. We did a, a really cool seminar. We uh, Mike picked us up a, a roadkill deer, and we did some demonstration shots to yeah. show the attendees the sign. Well, the- this, let's keep going on this subject because this is interesting. Like, when, when do you decide once you get the call whether it's worthy of a track or not worthy of the track and what step like you just went through with me what are the things that are you questioning that hunter when they make the call to you um i try to take all my tracks i don't care okay. and i really feel for that hunter i feel that if he's called me and asked me for my help i'm committed um i try to keep him talking i ask a lot of questions Probably the only tracks I don't take, and I found myself breaking that rule, are the high back hits. Mm -hmm. Um, That's where a deer will get hit and drop instantly to the ground and then the hunter like either loses sight of it or Or has a party. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) And the deer gets up and runs away. Um, And and that happens two or three times a year. Uh, There is blood with those sometimes. And I'll go out and, and check for them. Um, but it's a it's a really good hunter that calls a tracker, I think. Um, and I like to keep the hunter talking. The more information they can give us, you know, how did that deer act when it when it was hit? Did it creep away? Did it bolt? Did it jump? Did it go down in front? So there's the more you can talk to them on the phone, and when you when you get to the site with the hunter. Yeah, because sometimes it changes when you between the phone call and the <laughs> actual in person. Yeah, does it? Okay. Oh, 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 yes. And and you you have a vision in your mind. You, you're imagining that deer and how the hunter's reacting, and you've got a picture in your mind, and you just want to reinforce that and understand if it was a pass through shot, if it was um, if the deer went down in front, is it a leg shot? What does the blood look like? Is it a muscle wound? And you're just you're you're just looking at all the evidence to to kind of picture where that deer is going to be or where it's going to go. Yeah, I mean, there, there are some trackers that, that do screen their tracks, but I think the majority of New Hampshire trackers, if they've got time, they'll take almost every track. If, if, I, if I screened, right. I'm up in an area where, where I get a lot less calls than in the southern part of the state, and if I started screening my calls, I'd never go out. Right. Right, right. That's a good point. And that's that is a good point. Southern New Hampshire and I think with social media has been been a huge huge push, you know. Yeah. Um it, the words getting out about leash dog tracking um because of the success, you know, the people, you know, you you find a deer for somebody that couldn't find it on their own. You know, they made a valiant effort and it may be just that the deer didn't bleed for a couple hundred yards and then, you know, Boom, you got one drop of blood. Or it just dove in somewhere and they've walked by it 20 times. We've had that in, in tall swale grass. Yeah. Um, you know, the dog goes out there for three minutes. They've been out there for two hours, you know, with five guys zigzagging through the swale grass. And unless you step on that deer, you're not going to find it. Mm. And, you know, within three to five minutes, the dog jumps on the, uh, you know, that that right there is, you know, that that's awesome, you know. <laughs> I mean, for that hunter, that's awesome because I've been in those scenarios where you look and you look and you look, and it's just the terrain. You can't, you can't help. I mean, we're not, we're not dogs. We can't smell for the most part. You know, we, mm-hmm. you're not. You could walk right by that deer a hundred times. Yeah, we've probably all done it. tracks where you found something that the guy has walked past. I mean, right. I mm-hmm. did one, what a couple of years ago, and uh, the deer was right there, mm-hmm. and they had, didn't know about trackers. And they had looked for three days in 90 degree heat for this deer. And it was literally that they had to have walked past this deer no less than 50 times. And But it was in grass that was over their heads. Right. And the dog just went, you know, it was like a five second track, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was ruined at that right. point, right. you know. But and then there's others, you know, where they go miles. You know, I've gone four miles and, and not got the deer because it wasn't dead. Let's talk about some of the the rules that come into play like you get your license and with licensing come a whole slew of rules right Mm -hmm. so you must have to abide by certain yeah we we don't work for fishing game we're not we're not fishing no that's a that's a fallacy everybody (laughs) thinks that we work for fishing game and we get paid 
Yeah. And in New Hampshire, we're not allowed to charge a fee. Okay. In some states, they can charge a fee. In New Hampshire, we're not allowed to charge a fee. We can take tips or donations, you know, if, if the, you know, I've gotten a half a gallon of maple syrup, um, you know, and, uh, but we're not allowed to charge a fee. We don't get paid by fishing game. In fact, we have to pay for the privilege of doing this. We have to have a hunting license and a tracking license. Okay. And, uh, um, but we do. We have a lot of rules, and we actually have more rules than some states, and, and, uh, you know, we have rules as to uh, orange, and we have to call in before we go. I'm looking for my piece of paper right here. Yeah. No, that's, that's fine. Go ahead and take a look. The, the, so you, you have to be on a leash. Like, there, you can't let the dog roam free. No. Which no. is interesting to me because you think about, like, a uh, uh, bird dog. They can roam free. Oh, absolutely. And, and I assume that these dogs are not just going to take off on you. They're controllable like a bird dog. Well, no. No, no not necessarily. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And Basically, you're teaching the dog to hunt deer. Okay. Yeah. And and here's here's my thing with letting uh, the dog off leash. You know, and this is a new concept. We we don't have that option to do it here. We have to be on the leash. Um, and I just don't understand of running the dog off leash. Um, when I run my dog, I know what deer I'm tracking. That he can tell me. Um, you can distinguish between other deer. So if I put him on one particular deer and he can lock on that one deer. We can follow that deer. Um, minus, you know, if you jump, if that deer is running, you know, and you've got bounding tracks, you know, you got 30, 30 feet in between each track, each hoof print. It's a lot for him to process what deer he's tracking. They, deer have individual scent in their hoofs. Okay. Um, and on top of all the other scent from a wounded deer. Um, and he can distinguish between different deer. I was just going to ask that. How, how do they know that it, it's that deer? Because they're a dog. Because they're a dog. <laughs> there's there's a, a, a lot of uh, scent receptors and um, the scent, you know, being given off from that wounded deer. Um, and, you know, if you have a dog that's off leash, how do you know that dog isn't chasing a different that, deer? A different deer yeah. That particular deer. I can guarantee you the deer that we're tracking is the deer that we put you on. Um, we've actually, uh, I tracked one this a few years ago and, uh, recovered it and, uh, it was a doe and, uh, the guy says, oh no, it was a nice buck. <laughs> and, uh, we had blood right up to that particular deer. And I said, no, and he said, no, that's somebody else's deer. Yeah. So it gets interesting sometimes. Yeah. We recovered a, a spike that was a, um, picket fence, eight pointer. Ah, uh-huh. no. <laughs> I mean, it, it seems like the dog tells the truth. They do. A, a trained dog. A trained dog. You know, a, a novice dog still has a lot of learning to do. It takes okay. them several years of yeah. of not just training, but practical experience. You know, they actually need to do the job, not just be trained. You know, there's only so much you can do with, with uh, shoes, with scent, and, you know, dragging hides and dropping blood and stuff. You actually have to get out there and do the real thing. Yeah. And and for the dogs to learn. Right. They, they learn. And... Uh, but we, we do. We have, we have a lot of rules. Um, you know, some states have different rules and stuff. We can carry a, a sidearm. Okay. We can dispatch the deer. Um, oh, we, you can? We, we can dispatch okay. the deer. Day or night, we can dispatch okay. the deer. All right. Typically in the daytime, we'll give the hunter the opportunity to. Um, they, can, they can dispatch it with the weapon of the season if the season is still open. So like the day after uh, bow season closes, yeah. we can track the day after. We can track for 24 hours after a season ends. Okay. But at that point, we have to be the only one to dispatch the deer. Gotcha. Um, the only person on track that can carry is us and the hunter if it's during daylight hours. We have to wear orange. Dog has to be on a leash. We have to have, like I said, a hunting license and a tracking license. Um, we have to call in okay. before so we can go. We have to call in before we go. And uh, you know, a, a big one here is we're obligated if we see something hokey to right. report it. Right. And when you say call in, you have a you call fishing games that are going on game. a track, yeah. So they understand that there's a track involved. Yeah. So you know if the if the police call them and say you know what's going on here, um, after they're open during regular hunting season, they're open seven to seven seven days a week. But in the early part of the season and the end of the season, they're not. So sometimes we have to call the police. So you have to call somebody. Somebody to, to initiate it. Okay. Yeah. All right. How often? When you get on a track and a hunter says, no, the, the deer went this way, <laughs> and you say, no, the dog says the deer went that way. How often does that happen? A lot. A lot. And wh- <laughs> <laughs> Joanne is just shaking her head. 
What is it about that? I mean, it seems to me like I'm trusting the dog. Yes, and we've been taught to trust our dog, right. and um, that's our resource. At that, right. so I, you know, we go with the dog, and um, I'm, the I'm dog's just amazed team. that you have people that actually say that to you because I know. I mean, yeah, you have some tracking skills, but you're going to tell me that you're better than a dog. Well, people, in you know, think about your first hunt in the excitement of the moment. You know, maybe there was a second deer that you didn't see. Right. I did a track, not last year, but the year before, um, really thick, thick, dry beech leaves. Very difficult scenting for the dog. That's a that's a very difficult scent. And it was hot. And very difficult scenting for the dog. So she was having a little bit of trouble. She'd have to actually stick her nose through the leaves and flip them to smell the ground. Yeah. And the guy put us on the start, and he's pointing like at 11 o'clock. And he says... I saw the deer up there, and she was having a kind of a hard time getting started because they had really mucked up the beginning of the track quite a bit. And because the deer had dropped like a rock, <laughs> laid there for a bit, and he thought it was going to die, so he just stood there watching it. And um, and then it ran away. And he said, "I saw it," and he's pointing at eleven o'clock. And I said, "Okay, well, she's having a hard time down here. Let's go to the last place you saw the deer, since it's within sight, and we can come right back here." You know, so we get up there, and sure, there's deer tracks. And Bella's like, "That's not the right deer. This isn't the deer." And the guy's like, "I don't know what's wrong with your dog. The deer was here. It went down over this hill." And I said, "Well, Bella says it's not your deer." Well, it's my deer. I saw my deer. It was right there. So I decided we were going to cast around in a big circle since she couldn't get anywhere from the beginning. We cast around and cast around in, in gradually bigger circles. And we kind of got down to 1 o'clock from where he had shot the deer. So a distance away. And we found some blood. And the deer had, there had been two deer. Yeah. And he just, you know, sometimes oh, there's two deer. Let me, let me, ex- and, and I totally believe that scenario because I've witnessed it. I shot a deer just this last season. And the deer went downhill into some giant swale grass. Now, I, I hit it with my muzzle loader. There was virtually no mistaking where the blood trail was because I had to clear a blood trail all the way to the deer, and it wasn't that far away. But as, I'm, as I take the shot, the deer runs into the swale grass, and as I'm sitting there, I see, uh, uh, and the deer's flagged at this point. It's, it's alerted and, and heading out. The deer disappears, and then two seconds later, I see a flag on mm-hmm. the other side of the swale grass yep. running through. Like, that, that's where my deer went. So what do I do? I start following the blood trail. And where I thought it went right because of where that deer was, that blood trail went, or where I thought it went left, that blood trail went right. Yep. Like, son of a gun, there was another deer in here. That can happen to any hunter at any time. I think the hardest ones, and Mike's had a couple of these, and these are the hard ones to trust your dog on, too. These are really hard tracks, is when the deer completely swaps directions hmm. and goes a direction not the way that the it was going right. and not the way the hunter thought it was going and a it's hard to it's hard to convince the hunter right. that the dog is right and b that little voice on your shoulder that says you know is, is your dog really right this time because you know the deer was going straight this way and all of a sudden the dog is going back the way you came <laughs> and and i had one last year the the kid shot the deer again it dropped like a rock and then got up his very first deer, and the deer kept falling down, and it went right, like directly at 3 o'clock, away from the kid. And then there was this big puddle of blood where it had fallen down, and that was the end of their blood. They couldn't find any more blood. And as we're walking up to the shot site, Bella is going crazy, trying to drag me left, so opposite. And it's like, no, no, we got to go this way. And she did not want to follow the track. She wanted to go left. Hmm. So I'm forcing the dog to follow the track. And the kid had followed the track himself, and we get out to the end, and she's there's no deer, and there's no track, and she refuses to go any further, and she says there's no track. And the kid is like, and his friends are just beside themselves because they know the deer went right. They know the deer went 3 o'clock. They know it kept going straight. And so I'm, I'm continuing my interview, as Joanne was, was talking about, you know, continuing to get them to talk. And I asked the kid, I said, you know, how were you tracking this deer? You know, did you look around a lot or... So he'd gone up to where he'd shot the deer and it had fallen. And he's standing there staring at it. And this is, this is a, um, like a bench. And then it goes uphill pretty steeply. And there's another little bench. And then it goes uphill pretty. And the upper bench gradually comes down and meets the lower bench out near where the deer had fallen down. 
<laughs> so um, he said, you know, he's tracking along with his head down, following the because it was pretty obvious blood, you know, and he was tracking along with his head down, and he'd taken a couple pictures of the blood with his phone, and he's tracking along with his head down, and so I said to him, I says, Bella says the deer went the other way. At this point, I'm either going to leave because she won't go any further, or you're going to have to trust the dog. And he trusted the dog, but his friends didn't. And what the deer had done was it had fallen down out there where they found last blood, gotten up, swapped ends, went up that upper bench, right past the kid when he was tracking it with his head down, Hmm. and went out the other way and continued. And the deer was just, it was just a high back hit, so we never caught it. But we did find a couple more spots of blood, but... that's, that's interesting. I mean, how often have we missed seeing the, the deer just because yeah. we're looking the other way? Yeah, and they're, it's just really hard to convince. And and Mike flash. had a track last year where the deer went. Didn't you have that one where the deer went a different way? and Com- it did a backtrack. Yep. We, uh, we tracked it out, and uh, the deer actually jumped over a, uh, a log. Uh, this was a gut shot. Uh, we recovered the arrow. Um, had good stink on it. Um, pretty confident that you know, we were going to recover this deer. And uh, the deer ended up going over this log, and I had directional blood <laughs> going over the log. And uh, then Ted jumped over the log, and he did a probably another 15 foot, 20 foot, you know, on path of least resistance that that trail, the uh, obvious de- deer trail. And he turned around, he jumped back over the log, and started pulling me back the way we just came from. And of course, me being smarter than the dog, said, "No, pick it up." Carried him back over the log and made him, you know, track, you know, pick it up. And uh, he decided to take me for a good walk. And he <laughs> knew that the deer wasn't out there, but he took me for a walk. And he brought me right back to the log and said, well, basically, you're going to listen to me. Let's go. And, you know, exhausted all other options of, you know, north side of this log. And I said, I'm going to follow. I'm going to trust him. You know, now I'm going to trust him. Right. And uh, sure enough, I mean, we, we backtracked for maybe 70 yards and then it veered off, and I had different blood, directional blood going back to where we just came from. Gotcha. The light bulb kicked on, and uh, we got into uh, you know a, a wet area um, in uh, in beds, and we found a couple beds, and we found another bed, and we found another bed. And of course, now my blood pressure is going up. I'm getting you know goosebumps because this is going to happen. You know, this is this is classic. You know, gut shot. You know, deer's going to bed. And, you know, get up and it's going to head towards water typically. <laughs> and, uh, it, and it was, it was perfect. And we, we did end up recovering that deer. Um, but it was, you know, a 70 yard backtrack on the same trail and it's, it's, you got to pick up directional blood. Um, most of the time when I'm tracking, I'm, I'm trying to watch the dog. I'm trying to watch Ted. I'm, I'm reading him, but I'm also looking for blood and uh, I want to find that directional blood. What do you mean by directional blood as opposed to blood? So when you have a, a droplet, if a deer's standing there and you have a drop of blood, um, typically it'll it'll fall straight down from the deer, you know, off the off the body or you know drip off the hide. Um, when the deer's moving, um, you're going to have little droplets, um, these what they call fingers of blood. So you'll have a, a, a round droplet and then this little finger of blood, and it may be as as thin as a pencil lead, um, pointing in the direction that the deer was moving. Um, and there's a uh, uh, John Jenine has has quite a few photos in uh, in his uh, in the Bible um, of that directional blood. Okay. And uh, you know, in in something you know, growing up hunting, I never knew that. Right. And uh, you know, we've got blood. It makes sense. It's almost like there's a whole forensics component to this. It, well, that, that was what we were laughing about at the seminar. We just did a we, we did a workshop for trackers. So. You attended the seminar we did for the general public and hunters. We did a very intensive eight-hour. It was supposed to be six, and the people let us go over two hours. So an eight-hour workshop, and a big chunk of it was forensics. Yeah. A big, big chunk of it was forensics. Yeah, because, I mean, you're telling me things that only you as the tracker and your dog and experience could figure out over time, obviously doing your research. Most hunters I know wouldn't necessarily pick up on that. And, and where to look for blood. Right. Um, not just on the ground, but you need to, you know, it all starts at the hit site. You know, that's that's where you really want to concentrate. Um, you know, you take their word for it. You know, when you do a phone interview, um, you know, you can you can read that person of, okay, is this a line of bull or is they really, you know, they really telling us the true story here? Um, you know, so you kind of get that feel of it. And then, 
you know, look at the hit site. Um, and a big part of that seminar, and I, I did the, uh, um, I, I stole that off at Andy Bensing from uh, United Blood Trackers. He gave it, he gave us the, his uh, flash drive PowerPoint presentation to use, and it was it was really good. And 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 Mike got a a roadkill deer for a statue. We'll do some uh, actual shooting of the deer in different places so that we could see the evidence left. Gotcha. After a shot. Gotcha. Yeah. It, it's amazing the uh, the sign um, that you miss um, in in growing up hunting. You know, I, I would have never looked, you know, that far beyond the deer. Um, you know, what do you have for hair? Um, bone chunks, you know, on on, uh, on a leg hit. You know, you'll have hunters say, I got them in the ribs. You know, look at the rib bones. And, uh, you know, because he's got chunks of bone that's kind of rounded. And it, it does kind of sort of look like a rib bone. Um, but I've never seen any rib bone on the ground. It's mainly from leg hits. Mm. Um, yeah, pretty much if somebody presents us with a holds their hand out and says, look, I shot him in the rib. I got a rib bone. We're just, our hearts sink because leg hits are tough. I mean, you, you, it's almost impossible to catch those. So you could, you, you've you been able to identify leg versus rib at this point. Yeah. Yeah, Very I mean, to, for, a, for a rib bone to blow out of a deer, you would have to be really close and shoot it with something big. Yeah. This, <laughs> the, the tendons and, and, you know, the it's some muscles. muscles. Um, that that bone isn't gonna, um, you know, cast out like that. Yeah. The legs um, are just tendons; they're not really much muscle. Right, right. What are some of the other things that you've learned over the years that you thought to be true as a hunter, but have learned to be not true as a tracker? Anything else that kind of comes to mind? Like, hey, the, this is these are some aha moments that wow. I, well, I back no to idea. the back to the gut shot deer always go to water. Okay. Yeah. I mean, deer when they're hit depending on how they're hit, but they typically, particularly if it's a visiting buck, you know, because bucks roam right. during breeding season, particularly if it's a visiting buck, if they get hit, no matter how they're hit, if they're not dropping dead momentarily, their goal is to get back to safe zone, whatever they have identified as safe zone. Hmm. So if safe zone is five miles away, that's where they're going to go if they're not dying. Um, and if they're dying, they're going to make an attempt to do it. And if water is on the way there, they will die in water. If water's not on the way there, they might not. I think, Joanne, didn't you get one a deer for Roscoe, maybe, that was up on the hill behind him that was got shot? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no water. No water. <laughs> no, we found quite a few deer um, got shot with no water. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I've learned, and you guys can correct me on this, is um, we generally don't find double lung shots. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. The hunter True. finds those. Yep. But we are told all the time that it was a double lung shot. Oh, yeah. They're, they're, the shots are perfectly broadside, both lungs, right in the money. Right. Yeah. yeah. I've well, never it, found one. That brings up a good point. Like, you're probably not called in on the good shots. You're no. called in on sometimes, most a lot of, sometimes. Sometimes. Okay. Sometimes, yeah. 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 We do have a lot of good shots, and, yeah. and they still need tracking. I mean, I did one last year that it, it was, we joke, Mike and I joke, because I'm up in the Lake Sunapee region, so it's kind of rugged up there. Sure it is. It's, it's not flat. And the southern part of the state is flatter. Right. With exceptions. With exceptions. So Mike and I have this running joke <laughs> that there are Diane tracks and there are Mike tracks. Well, I got a call in my area for what I call a mic track. And it uh, was a guy, shot the deer perfect. He just couldn't find it. Hmm. I mean, it was a perfect shot. The deer was dead. The deer was only 100 yards away. He couldn't find it. And uh, and it was what, what Bella considers an easy track. And we did a couple of those last year, but what Bella considers an easy track and what the hunters consider an easy track are different. Right. What the hunters consider an easy track, they don't call us. Um, but it was a perfect shot literally perfect shot and the deer was deader than dead oh. so we do get we do get perfect shots if the hunter just can't find the deer you know if right. there's no blood that's the kicker yeah some of these perfect shots are no blood right i shot a deer a few years ago shot it right in the heart not a drop of blood i had to take my own dog out yeah to look for this deer <laughs> which was right there just i couldn't see it i couldn't yeah. find it yeah um so you know some of these perfect shots either don't bleed or they bleed slow enough that the deer can. Yeah, yeah. I've I've had shots that were 
the deer died. It was 300 yards, 400 yards of no blood. We found the deer by a grid search. Yeah. Right? That's. Yeah. I mean, if you, you know, we, we had a deer, a doe shot by crossbow, should have by all rights been right through the heart. Yeah. The hole was right behind the leg. She went a good way, so obviously it wasn't right through the heart. Yeah. Or grazed it or something. And she was dead in someone's backyard. Yeah. And Mike's found some. Mm. And they're not places you would look as a hunter. Well, let's take a coffee break. And when we come back, we'll continue our conversation about wounded deer tracking dogs with Diane Richardson, Joanne Greer, and Mike LaFleur. Hello, I'm Grant Woods, and as a wildlife biologist, I've learned through the decades that big antlers start in the dirt. It's all about quality soil. Years ago, when research clearly showed that tilling, disking, or disturbing the soil decreased the quality of soil, I changed to a no-till system. As the research progressed and more and more people were focused on soil health, I changed to using cover crops and keeping a living root in the soil as many days throughout the year as possible. Now our food plot systems actually improve the soil instead of degrade it, and we're growing larger and healthier deer. In a similar way, I've learned that several coffee importers don't hold the same value for natural resources that I do. They actually do things that harm the environment instead of help the environment and the people that work those coffee plantations. It's even more discouraging that several coffee importers actually support lobbyists that are against hunting and our hunting traditions. Last winter, I met Ken, Paul, and Mike, three brother-in-laws that love coffee and hunting. Due to their love of coffee, and quite candidly, the people that grow and process the coffee, they work to bring us Hunter's Blend coffee. Paul, Ken, and Mike buy directly from the coffee producers. This allows them to pay the producers at least twice the normal rate and be able to donate to hunting organizations. I love it when I have an opportunity to purchase from folks that want to protect our natural resources and the people working the land and protect hunting and the hunting heritage. I encourage you to go to huntersblendcoffee.com and order some today and ask your local sporting goods retailer to stock their coffee. It's more important now than ever for hunters to stick together and support conservation of our natural resources. And now back to our conversation about the wounded deer tracking dogs with Diane, Joanne, and Mike. Would you have that one next to a garage? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> that was that was a great track. Um, it, they had decent blood, um, and this is a trust your dog moment. Um, and it's... it's uh, you know, southern New Hampshire, not suburban hunting, but there's houses close by. Um, and uh, last bed um, disappeared. It's like the deer got up and, you know, vanished. Uh, they couldn't track it anymore. Uh, so, uh, obviously, they called called me to bring the dog in. And uh, Ted started bringing me up. You could see the, the neighbor's house lights on. And we're starting to get fairly close to it. And... Uh, the guy says, there's no way the deer went up there. And I said, just let me trust the dog for a minute. Just stay here. I'll be right back. And uh, proceeded to the back side of the garage. And uh, there's barrels. I mean, if you go on my Facebook page, I've got photos of it. That's where the deer died. Wow. Um, it was right in back of the guy's garage. He had a boat. There was a, a tire, a barrel. Um, that was not the first time that deer has been in that area. Um, back uh, to the safe zone thing Yeah, again. back to the safe zone. Right. Um, Darren Duran um, down in New Jersey. Um, oh, the deck deer. Yes. This, uh, his, his dog is absolutely phenomenal, um, awesome bloodline. He's done a boatload of training, uh, his dog Theo. Um, and I was just totally amazed. And, and um, you know, most, most of the trackers, you know, we, we all talk to each other because you're going to learn, um, you know, I could do a round table. I can talk a dog off a meat wagon. And I just love hearing the stories, and, and you pick up so much. Um, and Darren called me on this one and, uh, the gist of the story was Theo tracked this buck and, uh, he hit the guy's driveway, paved driveway. We're down in New Jersey, very tight, tight quarters. Um, and Theo lost it in the driveway and he, he did a, a bunch of searching around and just kind of gave up on it. There was nothing else that they could do. Theo lost it in the driveway and he had no rhyme or reason. He thought he maybe backtracked or whatnot. So Darren kind of gave him the, uh, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, three days later, the homeowner um, of, that the, of that driveway um, called 
uh, called the hunter. Um, of course, they made contact because they were in the guy's yard. Um, called the hunter and said, hey, something stinks around here. <laughs> um, and they looked, and it, the deer actually climbed underneath or climbed underneath the guy's deck. Now, he had lattice work, and where the AC compressor was, there was no lattice. The deer snuck in between the lattice and the AC compressor and climbed and died underneath that deck. Wow. And that was uh, four days later. Uh, he's got photos of it. It was it was a um, typical, beautiful South, you know, New Jersey buck. Right. Um, and uh, so it was a racked buck. It wasn't it, just a little fawn. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. And, and and no no fault of of the dog or the hunter or or the or the tracker. You know, they they're not. Um, you know, just because you put a dog on it doesn't mean that you're going to recover the deer. Yeah, we're not magic. And it, it, and you know, with so many. Uh, scent receptors and and whatnot in and on tar you know to to track that individual scent and with no blood yeah. and who's to say that deer was there uh, you know when they were tracking right it, you know it could have went in there later on right um you know after the hunters left and, and that's you you know you get you know we talked about stats of how many deer go um you know that are wounded that are not recovered um, there's a handful of tracks, and uh, you know every year I'll get you know five or six of them. And for whatever rhyme reason, you know everybody has good days, bad days. Same with the dogs. You know it's not a guarantee if you put the dog on one that you're going to recover the deer. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the deer has to be dead in order to recover it. But there's you know there's six, so many variations in a lot. Yeah. And and I when I get up to heaven, I'm going to go and say, okay, what happened on this track here? Because I really couldn't tell you, you know, what what happened. Yeah. This one really has my goat um i want to get back to uh what you were talking about you finding that deer that went 400 yards and you know you found it but it was by grid searching right so now that you know that uh you know leash dog tracking is available um you know and and you know i and i i want to see the hunters recover their own deer and and there is you know some training for the hunters too um you know try to find your own deer um you know obviously you have blood and um, you know, try to track that blood, track the hoof prints, you know, go, go out a ways, you know, 50, 60 yards. If, uh, if things aren't working well and you're not, you know, seeing the sign, give a call, um, you know, get, get one of us online and say, listen, you know, this is what I've got going on. Can you come, you know, and, and, you know, with the amount of phone calls that, you know, we get, um, you know, be blatant honest you know we i'm I'm on a track right now you know do what you got to do um you know but it's best if you don't push that deer you don't do that grid searching because if we can bring a dog in there the chances of recovering that deer very fast versus grid searching is a lot higher than you know when you bring in a pile of people um not that it's not possible but it's so much harder after you bring a pile of people in there for that dog to decipher okay the blood so the dog's going to pick up the the blood scent that's that's the, the blood strongest and the hair and the it, it's the strongest scent okay you know, he's going to follow the blood so if you have a bloodline you know uh, that you know um you know a, a real strong bloodline that you know you should be able to recover that deer because there is so much blood um but the dog's going to pick up that scent first so somebody that's tracking, you know, in your tracking party, your friends get some blood on their shoes, and now they start walking around. Well, the dog's going to try to follow that fresh scent. That that blood scent is going to be the strongest. Well, this is where the deer went. Not necessarily. It's blood on your shoes that the dog's following, and he's not putting, you know, two and two together because this scent is really fresh. This has got to be the deer. Yeah. And then you bring back to last blood. And you may go out that cast, you know, you may go where that hunter or the, the, the searcher worked um, and come back to last blood. And it takes a lot. And then finally it'll click, you know, the but dog. That, that's very exhausting for the dogs. Well, it's like running a marathon yeah, for the dog. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've spent two hours with Bella trying to figure out the grid search pattern or the circle search or whatever you want to call it. Right. And uh, my previous tracking dog, her very first track, we did clover leaves for a couple hours because the deer had blood heavy to begin with and everybody stomped through it all three of them and then all three of them searched in different directions from the last blood right. and so the dog would go out and around and back and out and around and back it took us a long time to get out of that right because the blood is the like mike said the blood is the strongest scent so we got to figure that out and it right you know if you spend two hours puzzling out where people had grid search versus 
15 minutes, the dog's not going to get tired as quick. Gotcha. And Mike, you, you had brought up the point where you like to see the hunters try to recover their own deer, but it sounds like there's almost like a line that you can muddy it up pretty good if you look, you go get six of your buddies and you walk all over the place trying to find this deer, then calling the tracker might not be so effective because you already mucked it up. And, it's and, always worth trying, but it reduces the odds tremendously. So what? where's the line? Like when, when do you put in your effort and you decide, okay, you did put in your effort, but you didn't mess up the crime scene, so to speak? Yeah, and, and that varies with personalities, you know, different hunters. Um, you know, I'm going to generalize, you know, the track, you know, hunters up north, they're, they're not going to be so quick to call, you know, they're, they're going to wait those, you know, three, three days later, um, <laughs> you know, to, to, to call the tracker. Well, you know, um, you know, by that time the, the animals, you know, you know, junk by then, you know, especially in the heat. Right. Um, you know, so that meat isn't salvageable, you know, for one thing. Um, but it, if the hunter, you know, hits a deer and wounds it and you have a good blood trail, you know, follow it. And when you start to have that little voice on your back of your mind saying, geez, you know, this isn't going the way I think it should be, you know, call. It doesn't cost anything. Right. Um, you know, I want to work my dog as much as I possibly can. You know, this this is my hunting. You know, I've, I've given up hunting in New Hampshire uh, deer season. You know, I'd rather track than hunt. Yeah. Um, but I, I feel I feel the pain. I feel the pain when somebody can't recover their deer because I've I've been in those. You know I've been in in their shoes. Um, you know, it, and what a reward to be able to to say, yep, I've I've tried. Um, you know, I need some help. And then you can bring the dog in, and the dog, you know, is like a rock star. Right. You know. Um, so yeah, there is a fine line. You know, getting back to, you know. Go go do what you got to do. You right. know, try, if you can't get get a, a tracker, you know, because uh, we're always all, uh, mark your last blood and and maybe go back and mark oh. the last several <laughs> bloods. That that's that's key marking. Oh, hey, you hit you hit a good subject right there. We're always taught that, you know, and uh, yeah, I don't know, I don't know that it follows. Spots, yeah, so. it doesn't follow into practice. Okay, uh, no, right. and, and not you know. Um, and don't mark with a GPS. It, no, and or your phone. <laughs> I I put a pin on my phone. Uh, I've spent you know an hour you know or more yeah of looking for the hit site. Interesting. So now I was they're like, not, it's they're it's not like White toilet paper or uh, orange tape. Just mark it somewhere wherever you found it, and then you can kind of start to see it. Yeah, pattern. I've recently. But you're saying there's more to that. Oh. Well, you know, a lot of people are now that a lot of people have smartphones. They're putting dropping a pin on their phone. You know, a GPS pin. That's but, not a. I don't think you can get that accurate, can you? No, no they're no. not. That's the problem. Right. They're not remotely accurate. You know, they can get you. You know, a parking lot distance away. But you know, we we sometimes we never find the spot. Sometimes never. Right. Because it's just it's not accurate. Yeah, like you said, toilet paper or you know some sort of tape or or you know the last several spots. <laughs> so, I've I've been on tracks where yeah. Can you get me to, you know, where you hit the deer? Um, yep, no problem. And you, you travel, you know, I'll travel, um, you know, throughout the state, you know, for a, to do a track. And I just got off the road, you know, an hour and a half. And now you can't get me back to, you know, to point A. <laughs> right. To, to where it all started. Or can you get me back to anything? Right. And I've, I've had tracks where I couldn't even, he couldn't, the hunter couldn't even get me back to the blood trail that he had tracked you know, for several hundred yards, um, you know, totally blow my mind. You know, I just drove an hour and you can't show me any blood. Well, it's up here somewhere. Yeah. You know, well, I, thought I mean, that was even if, even deer if you hunting 101, no, really. even if you right. think the deer is dead over there, you should always mark where the deer was standing Yeah, when you shot it. Right. That should be the first thing you do when you leave your spot, you shot the deer, be it a stand or a ground blind or standing on the ground or whatever. You should always walk over to where the deer was. Even if there's no blood there, just where the deer was and do that first. And so many people don't. Well, there's a huge scent and from shooting that you have evidence, maybe feet up in the... But you can't see. Yeah. You have spatter everywhere and it is a very good... 15 good feet in the tree. If, it, if it's oh, a gunshot, yeah. if it's a gunshot. Yeah, Mike had, oh. on our roadkill, Mike brought this uh, big, huge monster sheet of black plastic. Yeah. And he hung it up. Above the deer, it was a hill, wasn't it? Yeah. We, yeah, it was, so it was like up above the deer, a good 10 feet, 
And then it came down and went under the deer. And there was stuff from the gunshots all the way up to the top of the plastic. No kidding. Uh, Fishing game, we had a conservation officer there um, that was uh, part of Albrook Educational Center. Yeah. Um, and That's the, where we held our, our yep. workshop. He was so amazed because um, they had never done anything like that. Um, and I'm not taking credit for, for doing it. A- Andy is the one that you know invented, st- it. invented it or started doing it. And uh, I tell you, what a, what a tool um, to use um, to see what, what actually happens. And, you know, you do a leg hit, um, change the plastic. You know, now you do a, uh, uh, a head shot. You know, you know, so some, you know, what's the sign that you have from, you know, a head or a neck, you know, a high back hit. Um, we sent an arrow through it, um, you know, to show the deflection, you know, um, hunters taking hunter ed that haven't grown up in a hunting family, you know, you, you learn these things as you go, you know, an arrow's not sticking straight in the ground once it <coughs> passes through the deer. Um, if it is sticking straight in the ground, you know, at a good angle, chances are, you got a gut shot. You didn't hit any bone. You know, you hit something that just let that arrow pass through. But if you hit bone, that arrow will deflect and, you know, go out another part of the, the deer's body or bear's body. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah, we track we track bear, deer, and moose. Gotcha. Those okay. are the three things we okay. do track. All right. Yeah. But, uh, but as, as Joanne was saying, you know, if, if you don't mark where the deer was standing, even if there's no blood there, we're going to miss a huge scent pool that the dog can start in. Gotcha. So that, you're gonna get, that's why, so that the, the dog can educate itself. Yeah, as, as, to, to, start. as to what deer. What it, what and I like to start, I think you guys too, too. I like to start at the start, if possible, because that gets the de- dog from no scent or general forest scent to this deer. Even if the hunter tracked the deer for a couple hundred yards, it gives us a chance to track over known terrain so the dog can orient to that yeah, deer. right. And then, um, then she's on that deer, and and there's no doubt, right. and no doubt in your mind. But if you if you miss, I mean, there's at the hit site, there's gonna be there's gonna be whatever splatter or debris, as Joanne was mentioning, from the hit. Yeah. There's gonna be the foot scent. There's gonna be the deer's body scent. There's gonna be hair scent. Um, maybe some urine, some feces, all kinds of different scents. And and dogs view items as compilations you know a deer to a dog is not a deer okay a deer to a dog is the foot the eye scent the antlers been rubbing on hemlock trees the fur scent the where the deer's been laying what kind of you know bracken or moss or whatever the deer's been laying in and deer dander and urine and feces that is what makes deer a smell different than deer b so dogs view in I don't know, stereo, I guess. Right, right, right. So their okay. nose views it in stereo. So, you know, like if I'm looking at your kitchen here, yep. I'm going to say I'm in your kitchen. But a dog's nose is going to say, you know, there's stuff in the fridge, there's stuff in the stove, he cooks stuff in the microwave, there's a trash can, you know, it's, it's just a different picture. Right, right, gotcha. Is there anything else that you've learned about deer behavior? And, and I was, you know, going to your seminar... Well, you'd actually track. So you're tra- you're tracking the dogs, right, with a, a GPS. So you're getting spots. Some of us do. I, I okay. do. I do it because do. I do a lot of education stuff. I have the GPS. Looking maps. at some of the maps that you've laid out. Yeah. I mean, those deer are going all over the place. It's not a straight line. Not very often. Very, sometimes you do. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you do. I'm sure sometimes that occurs, but I mean, it was going came back down and did a couple circles and went off. To but the, some of that is the dog uh, analyzing the way the scent moves on the terrain right, because right. scent isn't just where you walked like i said i do akc tracking and that's people tracking and they lay out tracks yeah and they make a little map of them and you know there's five turns and right angles and they leave objects and stuff and they're done within a pretty short period of time and they're done on not flat terrain at the advanced levels but they're not very old, so the scent is within 10 or 15 feet of where the people walked for the most part. Yeah. But some of our tracks are 12, 8, 12, 24 hours old, and terrain and structure and air yeah. come into play because scent is like water and smoke combined. So it doesn't stay in one spot. So the deer may go relatively straight. The deer may go from where you shot it diagonally across this hill across the table, and then down into a swamp. 
But in the meantime, 12 hours later, the sun has come up, the sun has come down. So you've had thermals going up and thermals going down that hill. And then there's a brook running past where the deer went. Running water pulls scent. And then the swamp itself, the scent goes out across the water and it gets sucked into all the different vegetation that the deer went through. So some of those maps that you looked at at my seminar, the dog is following the scent drift. So the deer may have gone, say, from 6 o'clock to 11 o'clock diagonally up that hill. But the thermals blew the scent up and down the hill in the amount of time that we were gone. And then the wind came along and maybe it rained. So the scent is going to drift mostly down the hill, and then it's going to pool into any depression or around rocks or logs. You know, there'll be pools of right. scent where it's drifted. Right. Um, you know, picture it as smoke so, and, and water. Yeah. So, and so the dog's going to have to follow that because the hoof scent is going to be pretty dissipated by the time you get past 12 and 24 hours. It'll be there, but it won't be very strong. Gotcha. So the dog has to determine. So a lot of times on the maps that I have, You'll see the dog looking, following drift, and then there'll be a section that's good scenting, you know, good moist earth that's not dry, and the dog will go really straight. Mm. And then you'll get to a hill or running water or some sort of structure, structure being stone walls, logs, depressions, and they'll get stuck. Sometimes we've gotten stuck in like a a blowdown section. Mm. (laughs) Mike's shaking his head. The scent gets all sucked up underneath there. The deer's not there, but the dog will go round and round and round and round, and you've got to get out of that spot to pick it up again on the other side. Gotcha. Okay. So it's very it's very viscous. Yeah. you got to, and, and true, sometimes <laughs> you just got to let the dog work through it. Yep. And yep. it gets frustrating, and, and I know as... as and as, the hunters as get the, frustrated with oh, it. Oh, ten times worse than you are, and, and you know what the dog can do. Um, and you're just sitting here spinning wheels, and you know the dog's trying to work it out, and... You know, you, you're trying to coax him, you know, come on, bud, work it out. And you know he's, he's trying as hard as... And there's as, just this little cloud. If it was green, there'd be yeah. this little green cloud of smoke underneath this blowdown. It's like, oh, my yeah. gosh, let's just get out of here. So it, the scent kind of gets stuck. Oh, stuck. it does, yeah. That, yeah. that oh. father-son track that I talked about earlier, yeah. that happened. Yeah. And uh, the deer actually walked down the brook about 70 yards. Um, and when it was, was running water. It was running water. So it, it was muck, muck boot deep. You know, yeah. it wasn't waist deep. Yeah. Um, you know, but uh, running water. And, uh, you know, he took me in, in, in the brook. And, you know, you got some rocks that are sticking out. And there wasn't any visible blood, but there was scent on it. Yeah. And we got, to, there were two crossings um, where deer cross this brook. And he'd actually get out of the brook, go up, backtrack up one of those crossings, sniff a little bit and go, nope, no, nope, not wrong it. deer and went across, crossed the brook, back to the right-hand side, go up that trail a little bit. Nope, not it. Back down the brook. That was so, so cool. That is so cool. And and when I explain to hunters that, you know, we'll come to a trail crossing, and Bella will go left, nope, wrong deer. Go right, nope, wrong deer. Go, you know, back, wrong deer. And and then she'll go down this other trail, and she'll go, oh, right deer. And, And it's just, you know, you have to explain to the hunter, you know, they're just che- they're checking you know six deer have gone through here and she's looking for her deer yeah what is it that well that you're keying off of for the dog behavior that says they're all different they're all different you have to learn to read your dog learning to read your dog is really important like joanne's dog is smaller than ours she's smaller than ted right oh yeah mm-hmm. yeah so she's got you know a totally different her reading her dog i probably couldn't track with her dog and she probably couldn't track with mine because we're used to reading our dogs mm. and bella wasn't my dog she was my husband's dog, Rob. Rob, yeah. She was Rob's tracking dog. My tracking dog is a Rottweiler, a docked Rottweiler, so no tail. And they track completely differently. And it took me two seasons to learn to read Bella very well. But Joanne's, Joanne's dog's littler, and she tracks completely different than my dog does. So. Oh, there's no question, Jen. Um, back to the water <laughs> crossing. Yep. When a deer goes into the water and comes back out, there's a lot of um, scent pool dripping off that deer. Mm. So when the dog comes out and finds a line after you've gone through water, you're pretty sure you're, you're on that deer. There's gotcha. not a lot of question. A lot, a lot of scent pool from yep. that water. Gotcha. Yeah. That makes sense. But each dog, each dog tracks differently. You know, some dogs, you know, when they're tracking, have a particular body language, and other dogs, that same body language might not mean the same thing. You have to know your dog. You have to know how to read your dog. And uh, now that I can talk with Bella and, and read her, uh, hunters kind of laugh at me because I talk to her all the time. It's like, are you sure this way? Are you, this way? You sure? <laughs> I, 
you, you teach your, uh, you know, the, there's things that, you know, the dog teaches you and then you teach the dog. It's a partnership, you know, it's a relationship okay. you have together. Yeah. And uh, in New Hampshire, of course, we have to be on the leash. And I've actually trained Ted, um, you know, when you're walking through the woods, um, you know, it's a pain in the butt to have him on a leash. Um, so if he's going to go left side of a bush or left side of a tree and I want to go the right side, I'll tell him left or right as we're walking through the woods. And the hunter will turn, you know, and say, did you say something? I'm like, yeah, I'm telling him which way to go. And he can actually, I can tell him left or right. So if we're coming up to a tree and I want to go right, go right, and he'll go to the right of it. Or Yeah, right. I'll say this way. Or yeah. a blow down. Um, he'll he'll always because he's, he's he's a dachshund. So he, he wants to go low. underneath it, and I don't want to let the leash down, pick it up on the other side. I want him to go over, you know, so long as it's not that tall that he can't. Yeah, and I'll tell him over, and he'll jump over the log. So he has commands down. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. Has. yeah. They have commands. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what I'm hearing is that in some scenarios, more in Diane's neck of the woods than in Mike's, that well, it can be physically taxing. Well, even Mike's can be. I, we, it's a, it's a joke between us. I know it's, it's a just, joke. It's a it's joke, a joke yeah. between it's us. Lighthearted, but it, it sounds like. I mean, if you're going on a on a hike where the deer went, it was not hit particularly hard. You might be going for a while. So it brings up two questions. Number one, how hard is it physically for you for humans? Because it seems like dogs can go for quite a while. And number two, how long? Does this take sometimes? Is this a, a three day process or is, oh. do you call it something? I mean, my fastest track is seven minutes. Okay. My longest track is five hours. And the, that doesn't mean that the longest track was the longest mile wise. It just took five sure, because of scenting conditions, because dry or right. some sort of difficult scenting conditions can take you hours when two days from now, if it rains or something, it could be five minutes. So, you know. Generally, I quit at three miles. I don't know what Mike's distance is. My, my, I generally quit at three, but I've done a four. Uh, multi days, not typically. Sometimes, I mean, if they jump the deer, I think Mike's done a couple, couple day ones where that you jumped the deer and left. Yeah, and came back, came okay. back the the next day. Yeah, and they actually, didn't track it for two days. They tracked right. it, left, and came back. Yeah, yeah. Which brings up my next question. And I mean, if you're tracking for four miles, you got to come to the conclusion, perhaps that. Hmm, this deer's not going to die. So, and you must have a line, right? I think you brought it up in your seminar that when is it hunting versus when is it tracking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. hunting versus tracking. How do you decide? You're always asking yourself that quest, constantly thinking about was it the blood? You know what? How far have we gone? What are the signs? So you're thinking about that as as you're going. I've had um, I've had a leg shot that's gone on for six and a half hours. Um, and we we got the deer. It was not dead. It was not going to die. It just ended up in a in the water in the river and couldn't get up again. Um, I think eventually it kept and going. Then you wouldn't have caught it. But you you know you do you start you look at all the evidence and try to make a judgment call. Plus you try to read your your hunter. Sometimes they're not willing to go on as long as you are. And the dogs right. sometimes will just quit. Yeah. Bella a lot of times will will get less serious about a track if she doesn't think the deer is dead or not going to die. She goes from, let's go get it, to, you know what, this isn't going to die, right? And I think Ted, Mike's talked about Ted being that way, too. He, I, most of the time, I can read him, and he'll tell me, yes, this is gettable or not. And hmm. and it, it goes back to, to scenting of the, the How deer. dogs view the deer. What, what the deer is putting off her scent. Um, you know, you look in the wild with coyotes and wolves and whatnot, they're not going to attack a healthy animal. They're, they're going to go after the, the wounded or the weak. Um, so when a hunter wounds a deer, um, I think that deer gives off a, a particular scent, you know, that it's, it's wounded. Yeah. That, you know, whether that deer is going to die or not. Um, and there's, there's some people that train, they won't take a, uh, a roadkill deer, um, you know, something that died instant. Um, they want a deer that suffered. You yeah. know, it sounds cruel. Um, but they want that blood from a deer that, you know, is, is severely wounded. Um, because we, you know, when you, you get ready to start training a dog, you, you collect samples. You know, I need blood. to interject that we don't cause the suffering to get the samples. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. We, we right. would get the samples from either a hunter who had to track a deer for a while or from a roadkill deer that had to be put down, something like that. Yeah. We, we wouldn't. We wouldn't torture a deer to get these samples. Right, yeah. right. You, you want, <laughs> yes. I wanted to Good clarify point. that. Come by them by chance. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. When you have that particular animal, that's that's the blood you want to save. Yeah. 
you know, you just don't want one that was, uh, you know, a quick, a quick kill. Yeah. And it sounds cruel, but that's, and that's what you want to train because it is a different sound. Yeah. 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 Gotcha. So you've all been on some amazing tracks and, Oof. right. Yeah. And, and sometimes. Yeah. Last year was my uh, most, couple of my most dangerous tracks ever as far as terrain. I think my longest track was the year before we had that four mile track, but, uh, you know, like, like Joanne was saying, you, you question yourself the whole track. And this particular deer was leg hit, yeah. but it was bleeding buckets every time it stopped. And I had warned the hunter that it was a leg hit. We probably weren't going to catch it. But because it was bleeding so much, I thought it might drop dead. Yeah. So it's, I'm, I'm out in the woods and I'm weighing to myself, you know, this is a leg hit deer. I don't normally catch these deer. These deer can run just as fast three-legged as they can four. Right. So do I keep going or not? And I probably stopped on that track eight or ten times trying to decide if we were going to continue or not. And um, somebody else shot at the deer and missed it. And then it crossed a road in front of two other hunters who bailed out and also tried to get it and didn't get it. So we, we hung it up there. My hunter was also practically dead at that point. But, but you know, like Joanne said, you know, you're in the woods and you question the whole time because if a CO officer, you know, if a, if a conservation officer was there, is he going to say I'm hunting this deer or am I tracking this deer? Because we're supposed to be tracking, not hunting. Right. And I think I think the majority of trackers I know keep that in mind, you know. Now sometimes, and because you've been so keen on some of this forensic stuff that you've learned from your dog and reading, <laughs> so you're reading your dog, the dog's reading the track, you're reading people, you've had some interesting encounters where some of these hunts and tracks that you're on, the, the hunt that was done by the hunter, in your estimate, was not so up and up. So you... you and I'm amazed that you even get these calls when the, you think there might not be such sh- such a clean activity going on, but you get involved because they called you, and then you're like, "Whoa, I'm out." Can we walk through some of those scenarios? Like, t- tell your tell your best uh, bizarre story. Uh, I've got one a couple of years ago, and it it, <laughs> it turned into a fishing game violation. Um, you know, part of, part of our um, licensing. You know, when you witness something or you you have something that's fishy uh you report it yeah um and i took a call and it was uh archery and uh it was uh, a lot of blood uh, and i wanted to recover the arrow I, and i love archery archery tracking archery shots because that arrow is going to tell you the whole story yeah you know with guns not so much but an arrow if you can recover that arrow um so anyways i i took the call and uh, I, I go over to where the hit site is, and, and the uh, the other hunter uh, partner was waving me. I got blood over here. I got blood over here. I'm like, well, where was the deer standing? I want to see where the deer was. So I'm trying to find the arrow, and he says, you're not gonna you're not gonna find the arrow. That thing deflected, and it's um, next town over. And I said, well, humor me for a minute. You know, what what color is your arrow? And he says, black. I said, okay. What color is your fletching? Black. I said, all three are black. Yeah. Said, okay. What color is your knock? Black. I said, you're hunting with a black arrow, black fletchings, and a black knock? I said, I've never heard of such a thing. I said, and Never so, seen one. <laughs> yeah, I've never seen one. Red flag popped right off. And, of course, the other guy's trying to put me over to where the blood is. And we're talking a boatload of blood. And, uh, you know, why they couldn't track this deer on their own was beyond me. Um, and we did end up recovering the deer. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, red red flags are going all off. Um, I made a phone call. They said, they just something doesn't seem right. It turned into a conviction. They actually shot it with a crossbow, um, and they put an archery tag on it. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So. so you could tell. Not, and this wasn't necessarily your dog behavior. This was like personal. Yeah, it was, was a straight a human straight, behavior. Yeah, straight kind of from the hunter. Can you? Um, yeah. You know, and, and you, you get that through the hunter interview. You know, it just didn't seem right. You know, right off the right off the bat. Yeah. You know. Yeah. What about you, Joanne? Do you have any interesting tales? Um, well, I guess one that I'd like people to know that, or other trackers to know, is to be careful um, when you get around roads. I accidentally we pushed a deer out onto a main highway one yeah. day, and somebody hit it. Yeah. Um, and that was that was. I've had a couple deer where um, my dogs found it first. They're usually thirty feet in ahead of you on a line. And my dog will immediately jump on the deer. Um, most of the time it's dead, but a few times it's been alive. Mm. And the deer gets up and starts to lay deer. Which, gotcha. 
is really a scary situation. Yeah. And um, I'm generally hollering to the hunter to load his gun. And I proceed to jump on the deer because I'm afraid of what will happen to my dog. Right. It, it's sort of a reflex. You just, Of course. And it's happened twice to me. It's happened enough that when I'm in really thick weeds or um, underbrush that I'm very aware of that now and try to keep my dog a little closer. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Well, Joanne has done, Joanne has done the most tracks of anybody for multi years running, I think. That yeah, we, at we've le- been busy. Of anybody she, in your group? Anybody in the state. In the she state. she wow. does the most tracks of anybody. No kidding. I, I think last year you were 79? I think 70, 71. I've done as yeah. many as 80. Yeah. 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 No she kidding. does the. In a season. I mean, wow. if anybody does a lot of tracks, it's Joanne. She, okay. does, she does the most tracks. Period. Well, I I don't have another job, or I have a farm. So, <laughs> and my husband's really supportive, and he um, takes the calls. And well, how cool is that, though? You just go on all these these calls and it learn is, and learn. It's so amazing, right? Right. I mean, you, you're practically a, a deer biologist from just from a behavioral sense of all the things you've learned, what they do when you get hit. It's well, crazy. we see, and all the trackers see so much more than the hunters yeah. do. I don't mean to take anything away from the hunters, but. We see an awful lot of behavior. We see an right. awful, we see more deer than absolutely any year. do. Yeah. Oh, I would expect the collective here to know more than probably yeah. some of the most seasoned hunters. More than we realize. More than you realize. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. How about yeah. you, Diane? What's your crazy story? I think my craziest story, and it's kind of a two-part story, um, was we got a call over in a, a farm town, and we get there, and the deer had been shot up on a plateau on a, in a field. With a bow, a a bow bow, you know, like a regular archery bow. And um, it had come down and crossed the road, clear blood crossing the road. Lots of blood on the other side of the road. And so we didn't go up to the start because there was so much blood down where it crossed the road. We probably should have. But he he brought us pictures and he had his picture of a bow laying next to this really big puddle of blood. And we, we followed across the road and across a brook and then... It was like the deer had gone insane. Hmm. And in a half an acre stretch, maybe a quarter acre stretch, there wasn't a hand-sized area without blood. On this, it was like uh, you crossed the brook, and there was this flat area on the other side of the brook, and then it went straight uphill. So in this flat area, there's just blood everywhere. I mean, literally everywhere. And he says, yeah, we found the back end of the arrow over here to the left a little bit. We didn't see it. Hmm. And... uh he said, we found the back half of the arrow and the flushing over here. And there's like, the blood is just everywhere. And the dog is going round and round and round because there's so much blood just everywhere. And then she finally picks up kind of the, the deer's actual exit trail. It was like the deer had gone round and round and round in a circle trying to get rid of the arrow or something. So she finally picks up the exit trail and it goes along for a very short distance and then the blood stops. Hmm. And I don't mean Peter's out. I mean, it was like someone had shut off the spigot. Right. And then she's like, but there's no deer. So we're casting her out, casting her out, and the kid's like, yeah, we jumped a deer down here when we were looking, because they had come in and they had, like, line searched it. Yeah. Um, kind of like African beaters, you know, they had two or three of them, and they just walked in a line. Yeah. And so we're kind of pushing her down. She's not really tracking. She's just looking. And there's nothing. There's literally nothing. And we get down to where they said they jumped a deer, and there is a set of deer tracks down there, and we show them to Bella, and she's like okay, we'll follow this set of tracks. But she's not like not like she is when she's on a wounded deer track. Yeah. You know, she's just like, okay, I'll follow this track. And it goes straight up this hill. And I mean, it's a vertical climb. Without the dog, Rob probably wouldn't have gotten up there. Yeah. And uh, so we're like, we, we searched out there for hours. Never found anything more. And Bella never hit on the thing again. And it's like, there's just something wrong with this track. There's totally something wrong with this track. There was so much blood, and then there's no blood. Yeah. So a few months later, the CO calls us. Did you do a track for this guy? Yeah, in this town. Yeah. Well, I need all your documentation on that. So I sent him my little map that I do and the information from my call log. You know, the kid called at X time on X day, and then we tracked it at X day at X time. And, you know, he, he kind of grilled me on the track. Well, turns out, the deer wasn't there because they picked it up. They shot it at night with a crossbow. Um, so this ended up with him and another guy 
being convicted of 22 counts of poaching in New Hampshire and Vermont. Wow. Yeah. So last year, we get a call for track. Someone I don't know their name. <laughs> Mike's already laughing. Someone whose name I don't know. And uh, get down there. And I like to uh, get their license number in person. Yep. So I can see the license. Yep. You know, people I know, I'll just let them read it to me over the phone. Yep. But if I don't know them, I want to actually see this license. Sure. To make sure it's not a made-up number. So I, we get the license out. It's dark. It's at night. We're on the, the hood of the car, and the kid's got his license out, and he says, oh, yeah, and here's my friend. He's going to help us track. He's been helping me all afternoon. And I look up, and it's that kid that had been convicted. Convicted, right. Who isn't supposed to be anywhere near anything to do with deer hunting. So I know he's not supposed to be there. So instantly red flags are going off that this might possibly be a sketchy situation again. Right, right. So between the house and where we were meeting the, the, them for the, the start of the track, I'm texting the game warden saying, do you know who I'm out on a track with? And he texts back and he says, he can't be there. <laughs> <laughs> well, he is. So, and again, another sketchy track. Yeah. Um, lots of blood, lots of blood. Deer went up a hill, turned around, came right back on the same track, and waist-high level leaves, there was a thick layer of blood, all of the leaves right there. And that was the end of the track. And there were fresh four-wheeler tracks. And Bella kind of cast about, cast about, cast about. And then she picked up another. And there had been two deer, a doe and a fawn. A, an old, adult fawn. Mm-hmm. Um, so she followed the adult fawn out. And it came right out where we parked the car and crossed the road and went up. And uh, so it turned out the guy we were tracking for was the guy they had tried to convict but didn't have enough evidence against. Yeah. So, again, it probably was another picked up put on a four-wheeler taken out deer right. but we couldn't right i don't as far as i know nothing got proven but it's just some of the sketchy stuff i i carry when i'm tracking right um you know i'm a girl and i'm alone a lot of the times if my husband doesn't come with me right he doesn't track much anymore yep um oh mike carries carry no i don't i i carry as little as possible <laughs> <laughs> i lose most things in the yeah. woods yeah Dang, oh. get your phone here, too. It's got some water on it. And a water. Okay. All right. Just want to make sure. All right. So if there are trackers out there or people that want to get into tracking or if there are hunters that need help with a track, how, how do they reach you guys? Fish and Game website. Um, we're on that under hunting. And there's a list of our telephone numbers and okay. our names. Gotcha. Well, those and are our good. towns. Yeah, that. By the end of the year, will it'll be populated? They they delete that page every year and then they repopulate it again. Gotcha. Um, there's on the fishing game website is the is the information on the licensing. Okay. And um, I try to to link people up with uh, trackers that are in the area where they live. Yeah. You know, like like if somebody contacted me that was in Joanne's area, I would say you know maybe you should talk to Joanne and see if she got time to give you some pointers. Um, or if someone's down your mic, I, I send them that way. Yeah. Um, they can also reach us through the Facebook page, New Hampshire Blood Trackers, and then I'll refer them to whoever's closest to them. Gotcha. Also. Awesome. Anything else you guys can think of that we, you want to cover? I mean, we've covered a lot and told some great stories, and uh, I learned a ton, and I'm sure there's... Well, Joanne has a, a, a story. A story. You do. You have, <laughs> Joanne, <laughs> Joanne has a story that illustrates um, public sentiment a little okay. bit. Right. about hunting and oh. and it's and it's kind of a sad story but it, it's it's um kind of a, about what we have to deal with sometimes when yeah. we're tracking in places that aren't like the wilderness tracking places that i typically track right. um mike typically tracks in in a little more urban areas and, and joanne's tracked in some really urban areas mm-hmm. um but joanne's got this story that's that's a little sad so I have this lovely woman and her husband and it was her first hunt and yeah. her first shot at a deer. It was during archery season and we proceeded to track the deer and we were getting close to houses in a neighborhood. We came out on the edge. I had blood right on the edge. We'd gone quite a ways and I could see across um I could see across a cul-de-sac that there was a swamp so I figured the deer had gone between these houses through the cul-de-sac and out to the swamp but we needed to pass and it was early on a Sunday morning I believe so I had the dog and her husband being a man I just felt like she should put down her her um, bow 
and knock on some doors so and ask if we could pass. She went around the neighborhood, knocked on doors, and nobody would answer the door. But you could tell people were up. The dogs were barking and et cetera. And she goes, but nobody's answering their doors. So she comes back. And I'm like, well, let's just sneak through here to the cul-de-sac. So the three of us go through the cul-de-sac. And we get out there and we look over and here's the whole neighborhood gathered around a dead deer on a lawn. Oh. And yeah, it wasn't good. So yeah. um, we we approached them and explained that that was our deer and we'd been looking for it. And the people were not very nice. And in the end, they made her cry. I mean, it was it was that sad. And her husband ran right. around and got the right. truck as fast right. as possible. Well, it's, it's, it's one of those unfortunate yeah. displays that you hope not to show yeah. the general public but sometimes they get happen. exposed to it and some people don't like it and it's unfortunate but yeah. it's just one of the other things that a, a tracker might run into uh, absolutely because you know if you're tracking in any sort of, of an urban environment and even you know i track mostly out in boonie land right and I still sometimes end up in people's yards. Sure. <laughs> well, deer go in people's yards. Yep. I mean, they're, yep. they're there more than you think. Right? Yeah, it's not a great feeling to, right. have to track but around people's But as the yards. tracker, now you're front and center involved in the situation. So, Well, we, we try to remember that we are ambassadors. Absolutely. And our behavior reflects on everyone. Mm -hmm. Joanne's behavior reflects on mine, and Mike's reflects on mine, and mine reflects on theirs. And, you know, if if we don't react properly to our interactions with the public, even when they're like Joanne was describing less, less than ideal right. situation or, you know, not such a great reaction. We still have to be professional about it because we're the image the public right, sees. Right. And I touch on this a lot on the show is that hunters are the ambassadors mm -hmm. for your sport. So you better, step up and be that good ambassador no matter what yeah and I, re I remember back when ed wills was trying to get the tracking legal there was a huge you know letter writing campaign in you know like the concord monitor and hawkeye of all these people that didn't want us to be able to track right. deer they weren't hunters they didn't understand it and even some hunters didn't want us to do it right so you know we we won so to speak it's been legal now for 10 years but it's pretty easy to screw that up. Right. Gotcha. So you can find information uh, about all of you or contact information on the Fish and Game website. What about NH Blood Trackers? Is there any place? That, that that's can... the Facebook page. Okay. We have a Facebook page, NH Blood Trackers. Okay. Um, and I'll, I got some information on there, and I, I can refer people to local trackers near them. Okay. Because it's always better to have a mentorship than it's easier anyway, if possible. Um, or at least get together with somebody once to get some real world experience. Um, I know Joanne's had a couple people, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Ghost you for a while to yeah, and it's been it's been really a positive experience to to yeah. teach somebody else yeah. and, and go out with their dog and watch their dog and and yeah. I you know well, uh, that and to encourage an interesting this. concept. And I mean, I would love to just follow somebody on a track. I don't know if you guys do that, but I mean, I, I think. Yeah, I mean, we, for a hunter, we, even if it wasn't my my kill, I would love to find out like what yeah. do these deer do and how does this work. I am fascinated by what you you. I mean, not every it. not every track is a recovery. If you think about you know the odds are thirty five percent. Well, it's not the recovery. So, I'm so much interested yeah. in it. it's like what happens. You know, following your dog, watching you read your dog, yeah. watching how the dog reacts in certain scenarios. How does it? You know. What are its mannerisms? Where is the deer going? Where does the deer bring you? Yeah, learning about the learning about the stuff that influences scent is is right. interesting too right. because you know it's not as straightforward as here's the dog, there's the track. It's a TV movie. We're now going to head down track without any side journeys directly to that deer, and you know there's going to be a parade coming home. It, it it doesn't always right. work out. That right. way. So, it very rarely works out that. Way. It, it I'm just going to throw, throw it out there. If any of you would like me to tag along someday, yeah. just give me a call. So well, Mike is Sorry pretty to. close to. He's in yeah. where? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It is actually. Um, not, it is the best feeling to find a hunter's deer sure. and see how happy they are. It, it really is. is yeah. It it should. I, there's nothing to describe it. Yeah. But some of our tracks where we don't recover deer can be some of the best tracks ever, too. Right. Um, some of the, some of the most so exciting tracks are the, the ones we don't. Yeah. 
of your dog yeah. and what yeah. that dog found, the yeah. information that yeah. they found yeah. for yeah. you. And anybody who's, who's interested in seeing the maps that you saw, um, I post them on my Working Class Canine Facebook page okay. along with my log entries. And I just do it for not because I'm attention-seeking. I do it for education right. because they are good maps for scent. You know, this is what screws up a scent, and this is what a deer that's shot this way can right. go. Right. And, you know, I certainly don't expect anybody else to put a tracking collar on their dog and, right. and post the maps. Right. But right. Well, that makes sense. I uh, I started a Facebook page. My wife was extremely happy when I started my own, because <laughs> uh, now uh, typically I'll I'll do a post, you know, on certain tracks, yeah, and uh, good ones and uh, you know recoverable ones and yep. even ones that don't recover right. um, have a great story to it. Yeah, you know. What's uh, the Facebook page? Uh, um, Mike Lafleur. Okay. Yep. Your just name. My personal Michael Facebook. Yep. Okay. Um, it's uh, for some good reading. There's some, uh, you know, I try to do a little story, you know, on each yep. track and explain a little bit about what happened. Yeah. Um, and then other people can learn from it. And, yep. Yeah. You know, and it's good to go back and read through them. Yep. You know. Yep. And right. I try to share. I try to share some of the like if Joanne will put up a public post, I'll, I'll get ask her if it's okay to share it on the New Hampshire Blood Tracker page. So the New Hampshire Blood Tracker page has a lot of information okay. on it. Gotcha. Because gotcha. um, I'll share different posts from different people. I share some of Mike's and some of mine, and yeah. and uh, those who want to contribute, letter trackers can, and and uh, and sometimes hunters will come on and say, you know, I had Joanne come find my deer for me, and it was just really cool. <laughs> right, right. I think it is cool. I don't post. Um, she I've had some she people yeah. um, actually unfriend me because because of what, of I what do. you do. Well, and it's been yeah. You know, well, I, I guess I appreciate each and every one of you and doing what you do. And it's it's fascinating subject matter to me. And I think our listeners are going to really appreciate it. So please just keep doing it. I love it. It's it's such an asset to the hunting community. You're great ambassadors. And thanks for coming into Big Buck Studios. Well, thanks to Diane Richardson, Joanne Greer, and Michael Fleur for entertaining us with their vast knowledge of tracking wounded deer with their trained leash dogs. It's a fascinating subject, something we haven't covered, and something that I really wanted to touch on after I attended the seminar that Diane gave, and the the commentary and the stories, and, and that was what really caught me, was the stories that these guys encounter when they're out and they get that call. Hey, I've got a down deer, come help me track it, and they never know what they're getting into, nor do they know how far they're going to have to go, but they, they really need to know their stuff. And the, the things that they learn about deer behavior after it's wounded is absolutely immeasurable because those things we as hunters, if we learn from these, these folks, will learn a lot more than what we could experience in a lifetime of hunting. So that's why I find it so fascinating and invaluable to us, especially when you're trying to find a deer you know you hit. So anyway, hope you enjoyed that. Dusty, do we have a Chubby Tines Tip of the Week? We do, Jay. And it's- the Chubby Tines Tip of the Week is sponsored by Morse's Sporting Goods. Firearms, use firearms, bows, use bows. Located at 85 Kentuckuk Falls Road in Hillsborough, New Hampshire. Give Jim a call at 603-464-3444, morse'ssportinggoods.com. Your dollars go further in New Hampshire. There's no sales tax. Morse's Sporting Goods. Going to talk a little bit about uh, food plots and what uh, you can do. Uh, I've been getting a lot of people saying, "Man, my deer are really burning off my half acre food plot really quick." I mean, they're just annihilating it. Mm. I said, "Really?" And they said, "Yeah." I said, "Well, you know, obviously you got a lot of deer for the the plot that you've designed, and maybe that's the only area you got. But uh, you know, if you, if you got a little bit of extra money and you can take time and go in there and put up uh, just a six foot, seven foot, eight foot netting fence." Uh, which you can buy usually through your local track supply or or co-op or wherever you've got somebody that supplies fence, but they make an actual like a, almost like a plastic fence. And if you go in there and you can put your fence post on ten foot sections, you know, every ten foot sink a post, and you know, fence posts are fairly reasonably priced. And but if you go in there and fence off half of that, it keeps it where you can let that half that food plot mature out, and then you can take and switch your netting over to the other side. That just gives you a little bit of control on how much browse that they're actually doing to that food plot because you know you spend your money on seed fertilized chemical spray you don't want them to go in there and annihilate it and just completely burn it off the ground and then you're down to to nothing so 
if you can uh, put up a little bit of control and and keep them off of one side of it, let them browse down the the one side, then open the other side up and close down the other side and let it uh, go ahead and get back where it's uh, regrowing and and actually producing that tonnage that you need to keep them fed right. Right. I remember Doug talking about that a while back, Doug from the Horny Buck Seed Company, about how like some of the challenge is often to keep the deer out before it's time to come eat, (laughs) basically. It's not dinner time yet. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, alfalfa or, or uh, clover or soybeans, they're going to keep producing. But, you know, just like anything else, if they get uh, too much browse on them, they're going to die. Right. They can, only, they can only handle so much abuse uh, at one time before they just, you know, they're, they're not a strong, uh, they're, they're not real strong where they can recover from that, from that down to the, the, the dirt brows i mean when they trim it off right the dirt it's hard for it to recover right exactly well excellent tip dusty where can we find you when you're not hanging out here in the studios with me uh, shoot me an email dusty at bigbuckregistry.com you can look me up on instagram and twitter at chasing antler facebook.com forward slash chubby tines outdoors jay where can the people reach out to you or you're not on the mic Likewise, you can shoot me an email, j at bigbuckregistry.com, and you can visit us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. We're also on Twitter, which is twitter.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. We are also on Instagram, instagram.com forward slash bigbuckregistry, and YouTube, which is youtube.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. On YouTube, you can listen to all of our podcasts in their entirety. As far as videos are concerned, it's a boring video, but the audio content is there, so you can actually listen to our podcast. You can also listen to all of our live shows that we've done on Thursday nights when we do do them, and we've gone back and interviewed, re-interviewed a lot of our previous guests we had on the show just to put a face to a voice, let's put it that way. You can always listen to our show on other places as well, not just YouTube. We're found on Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Play, and as an Amazon Alexa skill, go to Alexa and say, Alexa, enable Big Buck Registry. And if you would like to submit a buck to our page for consideration and be featured on our page in front of 250,000 diehard deer hunting fans, all you have to do is go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck and all of the instructions will be right there. I think that's pretty much everywhere we're at. I think that's a wrap, Dusty. That's a whole lot of big buck, Jay. Sure is. I'm Jay Scott. I'm Dusty Phillips. And this is the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. We'll see you next week. Yeah.